This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I talk with video games industry veteran Mark Kern, and we discuss what other creatives can learn from the creative process that games designers go through. We look at crowdfunding and how that's changing niche gaming, and also the rising cost of creating and developing video games. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to have Mark Kern. Mark is a video industry game veteran who has been making games all of his life. After graduating from law school, he founded his first games company, which worked with Blizzard Entertainment. Mark is perhaps best known for being team lead on the massively successful World of Warcraft game, as well as working on other classic titles, including Diablo and Starcraft. In 2012, he founded the League for Gamers as a response to the Stop Online Piracy Act. And today, its members include avid gamers who promote positive gaming, good sportsmanship, research and advocacy for their hobby. So welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be here. So share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. Well, um... Kind of exciting uh, thing, I guess, is I've, I've gone back and revisited one of my old games, uh, World of Warcraft. Um, there's a lot of players who are interested in the original version that's uh, well over 10 years old at this point. And, um, and so we've, uh, you know, I've joined uh, with other gamers uh, in a petition to uh, get Blizzard to re-release this classic, kind of like a, a historic, both as a historical moment, because it's a very important game in, in, in gaming culture, but also because... Uh, I was surprised. Uh, people want to play it again. I mean, it's an old game, but the old gameplay, I guess, is, is, has lasted and stood the test of time. So that's been gathering steam, and we're actually meeting with Blizzard to discuss it, which is very exciting. Um, and, um, you know, and that dovetails nicely with what I'm doing with League for Gamers, which is, you know, um, promotes positivity in gaming, but also acts as sort of like a consumer advocacy group, trying to give gamers a voice for... Um, you know, with publishers and, and with game developers. And how did you first kind of develop your craft or learn your craft as a, as a, as a games uh, designer? Um, uh, I mean, you, you've, you, I believe you've had a kind of a couple of different functions in terms of uh, how games are created, but, but where did it all start for you? You know, I've always been um, uh, a game player since, since, they, since they came about on, on the early... Uh, you know, Pong systems on the TV that I would sneak to my friend's house to play in black and white. And uh, um, I maintained that interest through college where I was uh, a member of a video game interest board on America Online, um, an ancient service. And I met some people there and and, and we started to make games together uh, even when I was in law school. So that's how I got started. It's not the recommended path. <laughs> but back then it was very different. Um, you know, you, you, you were selling, I remember when companies like Bungie, the makers of Halo, were selling their games out of a paper bag on a convention center floor. So um, these days I have different advice on how to get into the industry. Because obviously this, 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 it's an industry that has really developed. And I, I don't know what the, I mean, you'll, I'm sure you'll have the latest kind of stats on the, on the top of your head. But in terms of how um, the games industry has certainly eclipsed the, the music industry in terms of um, revenues as well. But also the, 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 the demographics um, and the types of games uh, have, have completely changed as well. It's gone from being a, a, a niche pursuit to very much a, like a mass, mass pursuit now. Oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, you know, uh, we, we first saw that um, on World of Warcraft, uh, where our demographic of female gamers, uh, which was you know, probably around 10%, shot up to 30 and beyond. And But probably more interesting was that um, these were, you know, we first noticed that these women were like the mothers of our team members. Yeah. Uh, we had... Uh, Women in their in their in their fifties and 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 approaching sixty that were playing World of Warcraft and enjoying it, and this is the first time that it ever happened 
with one of our games. And so that was fascinating uh, to see to see that happen. And of course, it just grew since then. And and many many more women have joined gaming, which is a great thing. And uh, and obviously, it's become much more mass market. Everyone plays them on mobile phones to pass the time on the subway or the toilet. And <laughs> well, and uh, there's different games for everybody. It was funny. I, I I definitely sensed when there'd been a tipping point of things when I was at someone's house, uh, um, and I can't remember how many years. It was a couple of years ago, and and it was an elderly couple. So this couple were probably in their mid sixties, and we we had we were having dinner and everything. And after dinner had finished, and there was that little bit of lull in the conversation, and the host of this of the, uh, this dinner party said, um, "So should we go and play Wii now?" And it was it was just that little kind of moment that kind of just made me think, wow, this has just completely gone from from uh, you know it, 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 into into the mainstream where your grandparents are now <laughs> kind of avid gamers and they're becoming really obsessed with game playing. Oh, I'm relieved because before my grandparents would want to play something like checkers, which bores me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as you say, obviously the casual gaming has changed, and it'd be, I think it'd be interesting for a lot of our listeners who. Um, Maybe if they're, if they're kind of new to how um, gaming works or how how games are developed, that, that kind of creation process happens. Uh, can you maybe just talk about, let's say, many of the games that you work on? Um, uh, how long is, uh, does it take to go from initial kind of idea inception of, the, of an idea for a game to it being available in the stores? And and is it different for different types of games that are, that are out there? Oh, absolutely. I mean. Um you know, I've done games in, uh, with a small team in a week, and I've done games with, uh, that have taken you know, well over five years to create. These massively multiplayer games that create entire worlds to explore take a huge amount of time and, and resources to develop. Uh, but even today, uh, it's, it runs the gamut from you know, being able to make a very simple game very quickly, especially with today's tools that make it easier to do so, uh, all the way to people still creating these giant worlds. So the process you know, really hasn't changed all that much. You, you kind of start with an idea and then you, you, you have to sort of get it into a playable form as quickly as you can because um, – you know what you're trying to do is to make sure that people are having fun and being entertained by it and there's no real way to do that without the interactive component of it of actually having people experience it it's very different from other mediums where you know uh interactivity isn't part of it and so you have to get to a point where your game is actually playable very soon i believe in order for it to to really get the get the 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 most feedback and the most success out of out of what you're trying to create so in creating that kind of minimum viable product or minimum viable kind of game that people can just you can start getting feedback on what what are you looking for you mean you mentioned about interactivity but but where does things like you know storyline character how are any of them where do any of them sit in terms of uh, what you want in that very first thing that you can test well games are interesting because you know they can focus on story or they can focus on um, you know, um, even the written word. I mean, text adventure games is how I, I really developed a passion for video gaming back in the day. But there is, but if you really want to explore the medium, we offer something that that no other medium does, which is the involvement of your audience. Uh, the audience participation comes through the interactivity of the medium, and, and the way I like to put it is that. Uh, let's see if I can get this right without messing it up. Um, if you remember, you know, writing books, they say they say show don't tell, right? They say that uh, instead of it describing the action, uh, you know, uh, illustrate it vividly with words and, and you know how it smells, how it you know looks, and, and let the let the reader sort of conjure up in their imagination this picture of it. And then you get to film, and in film, you start cutting out dialogue and description, and you're replacing it with imagery, and the imagery is so much more. Uh, higher bandwidth, if you will. You can deliver so much more information. A picture is worth a thousand words. And so the importance is really upon the pairing of the words and exploring the visual medium to enrich that storytelling. But games, it's really about the interactivity. It's like, you know, I say, hey, instead of showing and and, and telling, let's actually have the, the, the player experience it and put their own input into the game itself and in order to create their own stories. I think that's the most powerful aspect of gaming. It is what gaming has that other mediums uh, don't have. I mean, even theater tries to be, you know, I've seen some theater that tries to be interactive. I'm a big theater buff. 
you know, where you involve the audience and you try to get them in. But it's not quite the same because the audience is still never going to dictate the story. But in games, I try to think of it as I'm creating a stage for the players. I'm providing them with all the props and then they have to bring their own story into it. And I think that makes for very powerful moments that you can't get anywhere else. So while games can focus on these different aspects, I like personally to focus on the interactive aspects of gaming. And I suppose if you were to break it down as as, as crudely as you know, how a dollar per hour of entertainment enjoyed, um, games would be pretty up there. Um, I mean, I don't know what the, in terms of depending on on the, the on the the platform that you're playing the game on. But uh, if we think about a book, which is let's say twenty dollars, and that's going to give you X number of hours, and we, then we think about a game or a film, which is maybe ninety minutes, and it's uh, it's cost you um, uh, you know twenty dollars or something to, to go and watch. A game packs in a lot of punch uh, for its price, I would imagine. Yeah, a, a game costs, you know, uh, these days, uh, AAA game costs $60. Some indie games are $20. And the amount of enjoyment you get is, uh, especially if it's got a multiplayer or a replayable component, is hundreds of hours, potentially. I mean, people who play World of Warcraft uh, literally put in you know, hundreds, if not thousands of hours into the game over a course of many years. And it, that works out to pennies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pennies on the hour for your entertainment. And, um, and, and I think it's a, a tremendous value uh, when you look at it that way. But I, I also don't like to look at it that way. I, I think that art is for art's sake. Gaming is for entertainment's sake. As long as I'm putting a smile on people's faces, um, you know, um, I'm happy with that. And, and that's why I said like the word crudely as well, because <laughs> it is, you know, and I, th- I think it's when um, I, I speak to a lot of bands who are, who are kind of um, struggling to build their fan base and build their audience for, say, for, for their live shows. And, and often they say, well, you know, I'm competing with this other venue, you know, across town that's got this other band on the same night. I said, well, no, you're not competing against that. You're competing against Netflix, and you're competing against that, you know, 150 dollar million dollar movie as well. It's 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 uh, there's there's so much choice now in terms of our of our entertainment. Um, when you've you've gone on this this journey as as a creative and as for, for creating games, can you tell us about a time when you worked on a project and you gave it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason it just didn't work out like you'd hoped? And more importantly, what were the lessons that you took away from that experience? Oh, I would say that to me the most the most you know disappointing experience I had was probably my last game working on Firefall because um, Firefall was my attempt to create a different type of online world which was not so much about you know power and level progression but it was about more action oriented and it's more about um, you know sort of uh, creative options you have with your character to do different different things and. And I wanted to also have a world be more simulated, more dynamic, rather than spoon-fed to you by a designer who's typing quests in all day. And uh, you know, when you when you start a company and you're trying to create a game, those are two different jobs. Uh, being a CEO and being a, a lead creative have very different demands on your time. And you know, I think that I just found myself way too caught up in the business end of it to be able to devote enough time to the product itself. And the product suffered for that. Um, You know, uh, eventually we had a very big creative difference and I was asked to leave. And so I left and they took it more towards the traditional MMO route, which wasn't my vision for the game. And uh, unfortunately, they, they, it was sad because it, it didn't do well. It, 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 uh, after they took it over, you just kind of saw this steady decline. And, uh, uh, you know, and, you know, plus when I was there and trying to do the vision and the business at the same time, that was a huge struggle. So I've kind of decided that my next endeavor, if I go back into games, I'm kind of semi-retired right now, um, is to basically uh, pick a game that's small enough that I can accomplish it with a much smaller team that we can agree creatively, not have a lot of infighting with these massive 150-person teams, and to sort of get more of a, a personal artistic message out there. So I don't know what's that in the music world, the solo album. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's interesting because it's it's um I mean that's obviously the way with uh you know the, the thousand true fan kind of concept by um, uh, Chris Kelly 
where where we have niches upon niches. I was talking to someone the other day. We were talking about an act called Vegan Death Metal Chef, who has <laughs> a really successful uh, show and everything. And he sings vegan recipes from his, in death metal uh, style. Oh, that sounds awesome! And it's great, and it's really, and he's got a great following. And that is only possible today because you have people. I had Amanda Palmer on the show recently as well. We were talking about crowdfunding platforms and how this idea that. The, the the kind of what we saw before is we saw that obviously with the the long tail effect the democratization of of distribution uh, creation and distribution yes. and now we're seeing a democratization of of how you fund projects so when it comes to in the in the gaming world have you, are you seeing interesting models in terms of how how new ideas and creativity for, for new games are, are being developed Oh well, I, you're you're speaking exactly to to my creative soul. I love the fact that because of digital distribution and the fact that anybody can have a website uh, and that there are even large websites that can coalesce, you know, sort of interests together into these niches, that now I can, as a creative, I can actually explore more niche games, games that, that I would love to build for myself that probably, you know, a very small audience would be into. And at the same time, the tools for games becoming free. There's engines out there like Unity and Unreal 4 that are used by the top studios that you can download and use for free today and have all that power and all that technology at your disposal now makes it possible to make these sort of niche games. I mean, I, I kind of joke that I would love to create a musical uh, video game <laughs> where you, you're, it's an adventure game where you kind of like go through and, and, and musical numbers erupt around you and you have to kind of like improv the lines and the dance steps and the whole sort of, uh, you know, screen and actors on it go along with you. That is something that nobody would play except me. <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 there will be a, the, there will be a demand. I was at a conference recently. It was a design conference with a whole bunch of different designers and they, and they were talking about synesthesia and how a, to, a lot of top musicians experience, um, have a thing called brain instruments where their representation of the instrument that they play is not the physical thing they're actually playing but it's something in their head and often notes will appear to them as colors or or, or certain sensations as well and I'm, I'm imagining now we're moving into obviously with with virtual reality where with the the the, the line between what is real and what is what it feels real you know it, it's kind of it's, it's blurring at the same time so with with some of these new technologies that are coming on in addition to the the the, the ways that you can fund things are you seeing any particular areas of interest for um, for you as a, as a as a games creator, where you kind of go, oh, that, that's an interesting area. That's something to be looked at. Well, um, right now I'm actually looking at revitalizing uh, tabletop gaming. I love playing. Um, I grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons, yep. uh, where you roll these dice and pretend you're a wizard or warrior and, and slay dragons. But it hasn't really evolved much since then in, in terms of um, the experience. It's still played with, with paper and pen and dice and a lot of bookkeeping. And, um, what, and my, my interest is saying, well, what if, what if I brought some technology to this? And I don't mean playing remotely over the internet. That, that to me defeats the purpose of the social aspect of, of tabletop gaming. But, um, you know, everyone's got a mobile phone and I would love to, to play a, a D and D game where, you know, you can, uh, message each other and have, um, your, your maps and your descriptions and your monsters and your treasures all on the phone. And when the DM awards you a magic item, he just shoots it over to your phone and there you get it. Uh, I've, I'm, suddenly reminded, I, I'm suddenly reminded of, that, of the bar scene in one of the, I think it was a star, one of the Star Wars movies where it's a very short part of the scene where they, and there's a table and they're playing some kind of game with virtual, char- virtual characters as oh. well there. Sure, like, wouldn't it be great to have little holograms you can move around in this thing? I have a, I have a, uh, obviously, it's a, it's a professional write off. I have a gaming table for, for, for Dungeons and Dragons. It's a beautifully made, all wood, uh, thing, and, and we move miniatures around on this, uh, on this dedicated playing surface with a checkered grid and everything else. And I would just like that to be a digital screen. You know, I would, I would love to be able to just have be one giant touch screen and move stuff around, um, and have conveniences like not showing players part of the map that they're, they haven't explored yet. Um, this is what I'd like to see because, you know, I, I was drawn to MMOs because of the social aspect, because of the, the friendships and the communities that form online. Um, but, it's still much better in person, and it's like, can't we bring some of those technologies into that uh, into that area where 
you know, we're sitting around a, a, a holograph, a hologram instead of, uh, but still person to person instead of, you know, uh, faceless and online. And do and you think maybe, you know, it's part of the reason why a lot of the, that, that the kind of traditional type of gaming with the boards and things have, have, they feel like they've not really moved forward. Is it, is it because they've, there's a small number of companies that have a huge dominance in, in that type of gaming, whereas in uh, maybe in, in online gaming or, or, or console gaming, there's a lot more players involved in the competitions, a little bit more um, brisk. You know, I think it's, it's, it's a, actually a lack of um, uh, technical sophistication. If you look at the websites that, even as they move to sort of digital copies of rules and things, if you go shopping online for these, these uh, role-playing games that are paper and pencil-based, you can go to a website and download a PDF, but the experience is like a website from the 1990s. It doesn't feel like shopping at Amazon.com or anything else. And, um, and the, the apps that are out there for sort of interacting with each other, uh, drawing maps online and sharing them, are, are very primitive by today's gaming standards. And uh, I don't know why. Perhaps people feel there's, there's no business opportunity in there. But like I said, I, I'm, I've reached a point in my career where I'm, I'm less interested in, in the money aspect and more interested in the what-if scenarios. And, um, you know, I wanted to get back to it. I don't think I, I fully answered one of your earlier questions about, hey, what are the, the funding methods for games and how do I feel about, you know, the opportunities? I, I spoke about the tools being readily available. But obviously crowdfunding has changed the game in terms of being able to realize some of these niche ideas. But you have to be careful. Uh, there are a lot of the games are very expensive to make. Video games are expensive to make, and you have people pitching projects on Kickstarter, and and you know for budgets that could in no way pay for the development of the game. And of course, you know some of them do get in trouble. Uh, a lot less than you think. You know, Kickstarter recently did a survey, and I think well over ninety five percent of their projects actually deliver but the ones that fail especially in gaming are spectacular failures and they sort of hurt the confidence and hurt the model for everybody else so that it's kind of like a, a double-edged sword there and in this creative journey you've had can you talk to our listeners about any insights or light bulb moments that you've had in your life where you've kind of gone oh okay i need to maybe make this change or i need to kind of go in this direction with the work that i'm doing um Yes, I think to me the, the, the cost of games is very worrisome. Um, I, I started with games that cost, you know, a triple A game when I started was a hundred thousand dollars to make, and a triple A game now is uh, easily uh, forty to a hundred to even two hundred and fifty million dollars to make, and a lot of this, actually, this expense comes from next generation graphics. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this. It's not that our games are getting richer or more complex from the code side. I mean, they have, but nowhere near as uh, complicated and expensive it is to create the art for these games. I mean, if, you, if you, we're approaching feature film quality graphics in yeah. games, and that's hugely expensive and time-consuming, and that does two things. One is not only does it raise the price of the game and make your creative attempts more conservative and have and force you to explore less ideas because you need to recoup that money safely. But on the other hand, it takes a lot more time. And the more time that you have to, between these sort of iterations of the game, if you remember we talked about getting to a playable state very quickly, that time increases. And the time between getting the feedback and implementing the feedback increases. And that actually makes, makes it very tough to get a great game out in a reasonable amount of time because you need that feedback. You need rapid iteration to sort of converge on the fun. We call it finding the fun. And I think that is the greatest danger to games. So I really, you know, and, and indie games have sort of like simplified this process by going with retro graphics, pixel graphics and things like that. The players really would like a more modern graphical setting. So I would like to see a lot more research done in the art pipeline of games and the tools that are used to create the art. I think there's a lot of room there and we haven't sufficiently explored it. And it's a huge uh, issue for our industry that not many people are paying attention to. So are we almost getting to the equivalent of like the mid seventies where you had those bloated concept albums, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, where, you know, that, that's the, that's the, of the, of the, the big games where it's just kind of, it's just become so big and so full on that suddenly we need a, we need a punk revolution in, in gaming 
where you have a, a lot more kind of um, kind of grassroots kind of uh, game design game developers coming uh, coming around, but using the, the the tools and some of the, the new tools that are going to be at their at their fingertips. Yeah, getting back to that raw element, and and you know, I think that indie music, um, and 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 the, you know, punk music came out, and it was raw, it was unrefined, and um, because it was cheaper to produce that way, in a way, uh, I, I believe it's one of the factors. Anyhow, it was it was, yeah. more, it was more about the emotion, the technique of actually yeah. doing it. It's about get, it's getting across what the creative, the thing that they wanted to get out there and say, rather than necessarily. The, um, the any kind of like fancy technique that they were going to have to try and use oh, to, yeah. to deploy I mean, it. You talk about these concept albums where they would, these rich bands would book studios for six months and live there and craft this entire album. And then you get punk where they come in and they do a set on the first take and they say, F- it, put it on tape. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. Uh, that's indie games now. You know, indie games are, the, the graphics are raw and everything else because the tools aren't there. But look at, look at music now. Everyone with an iPad, you know, because I do audio recording too. Anyone with an iPad and a, a, it can go buy a decent mic and a decent DI and start recording, you know, what would have been considered a pro level album back in the day. We need those tools in independent gaming so that we can now, you know, go from that raw punk era style of, hey, we don't have a lot of money, but we're going to get this music to you anyways, even if it might be rough around the edges, to, Hey, we can produce stuff that's just as polished as 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 the, as the triple A guys, and you know while there are much better tools for that now, I believe the art side still suffers from you know uh, um, a lack of enough automated tools to take out a lot of the drudge work to hit that level of polish. And when we are talking about tools, do you have any online resources or tools that that you love that help maybe on the the creative side of what you're doing? Well, you're going to have to be more specific because the creative side of gaming encompasses everything from music to animation to modeling. So, to- are there any tools tools that you use that um, that the non game creators you think they would be interested in in checking out? And, uh, for example, what one of the most common ones we hear on, on the show here is Evernote um, n- because it's just got so many uses for people. I have writers using it. I have uh, we have uh, songwriters who are recording their their song ideas. It's just a very easy kind of online tool to be able to use. Well, to me, nothing nothing beats <laughs> graph paper and a pencil for games. Sometimes, yep. in, the, in the initial stages, I use uh, for writing, you know, stories on video game aspects. I use Scrivener, which is a uh, yes, great uh, tool. It's a uh, it's a program available for uh, Mac and PC that works on a note card motif. So you can jot down a bunch of ideas, and they, and they have virtual index cards, and you can sort of sort through and organize them and structure your game that way. And it's actually be- it's beautifully untech. It's one of the things I like about that app. It's not the, it's not a super streamlined type of app, but it just does. It's, it's very good at get, enabling you to kind of get your ideas and to arrange your ideas. Especially if you, if you have a lot of small fragmented ideas that are scattered and you'd like to see them all at once and collate them, Scrivener is a very good app for that. And so, in my design process, I often use Scrivener in the beginning. And I won't write a design doc. I'll just start jotting off these ideas on cards. And then, you know, I'll go back a week later and start sorting through them and coalescing them. But at some point in games, you really have to leave paper behind. And, and honestly, I don't believe in giant design docs. So Scrivener is even better for, for me for that because I can go with these note cards. Because I'd like to get it into an engine as soon as possible. And for me, um, you know, I've, I've been looking at Unreal um, and as well as Unity. And Unity is simple enough that I've been teaching my son how to program games in Unity, and I think it's a really probably one of the more approachable tools out there. Unfortunately, it's still not um, simple enough for non-technical people to use without a lot of you know watching tutorial videos and, and, and getting into it. But it's getting there. And, and we could really use some, some better tools for that. I mean, obviously, um, there are level editors in games so if you like a particular game and you'd like to create a map or a variation of it in that genre, um, there's editors for, say, you know, uh, StarCraft II that lets you, that you make games out of it. And you can be very successful. If you look at um, the success of MOBA games, games like uh, League of Legends, uh, those were created in the Warcraft III editor and played online on the Warcraft III network before they branched off and became their own thing. So... Yes, there are tools out there. I'm still not satisfied that they're easy enough uh, for, to get more creators out there. But um, 
but yeah, I, I, I go from Scrivener and then I'll go into an engine. Uh, I'm very comfortable technically, so if I need to open up uh, and start writing in C++, I could do that too. But for getting ideas out quickly and prototyping, something like Unreal or Unity can be very valuable. And if you could recommend just one record, one album, and one book to our listeners, what would they be? <laughs> um Okay, so um, you're making me think very hard now. So one album. Gosh, yeah. this is, um, I like a lot of trash. I like top, pop and top 40. And I'm, I feel like if I throw something out there, it, it doesn't should. even do it for me as a favorite album. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it, but if, you, if you're looking for something that's creative, I, I think those, those like, like you said, those epic concept albums – kind of are very kind of RPG-ish. When I look at, um, you know, uh, The Who's Tommy, or if I look at, you know, uh, Blue Oyster Cult, uh, some of those albums tell a very kind of fantasy RPG story through their arc. And, um, and to me, those were, those were kind of inspirational in terms of, you know, uh, getting that vibe and, 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 and knitting things together. Um, as far as books... I don't know. I read a lot, but, uh, you know, there's a, uh, is there a book, is there, is, there, is there a book that you've gifted more often, uh, over the past 12 months or you, or you've told people about more often than over the past 12 sure, months? Sure. That one, that one's easy. Uh, ready player one and, uh, ready player one is, is a, is a pop romp through eighties culture, uh, told in, in a, in a, uh, near future where players are playing, an online virtual game and competing for the, uh, a giant uh, multi-million dollar prize in that game. Uh, it has everything that I grew up with. It's really fun to read. Um, and, uh, and I've spoken with the author, Ernest Klein, and he's a great guy, fun guy. And that is, if you want to understand uh, a little bit of what it's like to play these online games, it's a very approachable way to do it. And it also kind of speaks to the future of online games where we're immersed in virtual reality as the characters in this book are and uh, sort of paints a tantalizing vision of where it could be. Great. Well, I'll, I'll put this on the show notes. People go to jamestaylor.me. Just type in Mark Kern and you'll be able to get the links for all of these. Actually, I'm going to put that on my Kindle tonight. I want to read that. That sounds really, that sounds a cool book. It so very let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So um, all you have are the tools of your trade. You were talking about some of the, like the Scrivener and Unity and some of these other tools that you use and the knowledge that you've acquired over the years. But no one knows who you are. You don't know anyone. You have no contacts. How would you restart? You know, so many people are, are doing that these days and and becoming tremendously successful. I would say um, pick, pick a game genre you like. I would pick a, a small self-contained game, not something like an MMO, but something that can be done with one, two, or three people. And pick one of these free engines that, can, you know, that are capable of delivering commercial games like Unity and start learning. Just watch, You can watch YouTube videos on how to do this stuff, which makes it much easier to learn. Start putting it together and, and make your game. A very recent example of that is Stardew Valley. Stardew Valley is a game for the PC, and it was uh, one man. I, I don't know his name, unfortunately. Or I, I would totally give him credit. And he worked part-time on this game for four years. And it's basically uh, a game that's inspired by early console games, uh, farming games like uh, um, uh, Harvest Moon. I don't want to say uh, you know that Facebook game because it's not yeah. like that um, but uh, he was he really loved those games and you could tell he loved the game and he took it and he expanded upon it and he included elements from other games he loved like Animal Crossing I can see influence there and he just recently put it on the market published it through a, a, a small publisher called Chucklefish and, and, and has a, a breakout success I mean we're talking millions and millions of dollars worth of sales for basically what was a passion project for one guy, you know, working part time, just slowly but surely, brick by brick, sort of laying this game out. And don't worry that your graphics will, might be dated by the time it comes out. Don't worry that you might be technologically behind because at the end of the day, no one cares. They only care if they're entertained by your game and it's fun to play. And that has more to do with the gameplay and the interactivity than the way it looks or sounds. Well, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing us 
with us your creative journey um, and all about, all about the games industry as well. Um, what's the best way that people can connect with you and find out about some of these projects you're working on? I'm very active on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is at Grums, G-R-U-M-M-Z. And I'm, I, I answer questions there all the time. And uh, we also have LeagueForGamers.com. You can reach me on there by a uh, private direct message. They're all open there. And uh, I love interacting with fans. I love interacting with people who want to learn how to make this stuff. And I try to make myself as available as possible. Well, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. I wish you all the best with your your future projects. Take care. Thank you very much, James. Pleasure. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.